Hello everyone and welcome back to tutorial 4 of MIE 100, the dynamics course at the University of Toronto. Today we're going to be solving four problems about kinetics of particles, specifically work and energy. Um, as usual, if you have any questions, you can always leave them in the comments below. So starting with our first problem, we've got a 54 kilogram pilot flying a jet trainer in a half vertical loop of 1,200 meters radius, knowing that the normal force at C exerted at, on the pilot by the seat is 350 newtons, find the velocity of the jet trainer at C. Okay, so this is a fairly uh, simple question. Uh, as usual, we're going to start with our free body diagram. But before that, we're just going to write down the values that we know. We know that the mass is 54 kilograms. We also know the radius. This is the radius. We know the normal force at C. And we want to find our velocity at C. So starting off with our free body diagram, if we say that this is the pilot, then we know that gravity is going to act on his mass. And because at C here, the pilot is actually upside down, therefore NC is actually going to be acting downwards as well because it's the normal force of the seat on the pilot. Now we're going to be using our curvilinear, uh, uh, curvilinear motion equations, but in the normal and tangential coordinates. And these are the sum of forces in N is equal to MAN, and the sum of forces in T is equal to MAT. We know that the acceleration in the N is equal to V squared over rho, which is the radius. And if we do the sum of forces in N, it's going to be NC plus MG equals 2M and then AN, which is V squared over rho. And if we plug in our known values, so 350 plus 54 times gravity, we can easily find our velocity at C. And that's going to give us 139.8 meters per second. Nice and easy. For problem number two, this one's going to require a little bit more work. So, at the instant under consideration, the cable attached to the cart of mass M1 is tangent to the circular path of the cart. At the upward speed of the cylinder of mass M2 is V2 is equal to 1.2 meters per second. Determine the magnitude of acceleration of M1 and the tension T in the cable. What would be the maximum speed of M2 for which M1 remains in contact with the surface? And we've got our values for the radius, the masses, and the angle beta. So we know that our V2 is going to be equal to 1.2 meters per second at this instant. We also know that R is equal to 1.75 meters. We know that M1 is equal to 0 0.4 kilograms, M2 is equal to 0 0.6 kilograms, and beta, the angle, is equal to 30 degrees. And we want to know the, the tangential acceleration of 1, and we want to know the tension in the cable, and we also want to know V2 max. This is when 
M1 remains in contact with the surface. So what does this all mean? Of course, we need to start with our free body diagrams. So this is our M1. And this is gravity acting on M1. This is the normal force on the surface, the tension in the cable. This is angle theta. And let's say that at the point here is the origin. So let's say that the distance from the origin to here is called S1. And our coordinate system is going to be in tangential and normal coordinates. However, for mass M2, we've got M2G. And we've got the tension in the cable. But here our coordinates is in X and in Y instead. And let's call the point at the origin here the distance from the origin to where the mass is. Let's call it S2. So we've got an S1 and an S2. From that, if we recall our constrained motion equations, we know that S1, the cable length, S1, plus the cable length, S2, there's two of them, is going to be equal to a constant because the cable has a certain length. So S1 plus 2S2 is equal to C. And then if we find the derivative, we're going to do v1 plus 2v2 is equal to 0. And of course, at1 plus 2a2 is equal to 0. Notice that here I said at1 because our coordinate system is different. And it's only considering the acceleration and the tangential coordinates. So tangential acceleration only. But here's so it's the coordinates already in y and x, so it's just going to be the acceleration a2. Let's call our first equation 1 and our second equation 2. And then if we use the curve in your normal and tangential motion equations, We know that the sum of forces in T is equal to MAT. The sum of forces in T for our M1 is going to be equal to M1G sine beta. So we're taking this direction. Minus T, the tension in the cable, is going to be equal to M1 multiplied by AT1. That's going to be our third equation. And if we plug in our known values, we know that it's going to be equal to 0 0.4 times 9.81 sine 30 minus t is equal to 0 0.4 at1. And then for our sum of forces in y for m1, so this is at m2 and this is at m1. So at M2, if we find the sum of forces in Y, we know it's going to be M2G minus 2T is equal to M2A2, because there's two cables, so there's two tensions. And if you plug in our known values, it's going to give us 0 0.6 multiplied by 9.81 minus 2T is equal to 0 0.6A2. And this is going to be our fourth equation. So if we solve for equation 2, 3, and 4, we will get 
A2 is equal to 0 0.892 meters per second squared. And we also get the value for the tangential acceleration, which is minus 1.784 meters per second squared in this direction. That's why it's negative. And we also find our tension in the cable, which is equal to 2.68 newtons. Now what we have left is to find our V2 max. So we start by, find. so basically we want to find the critical maximum speed. And to do that, we're going to use the sum of forces in N, the normal sum of forces, which is equal to MAN. However, we're going to do that when N is equal to 0, the normal force. And this is because we want to find our V1 max as soon as it starts losing contact with the surface. If you remember our question, it says we want to find our V2 max when M1 remains in contact with the surface. So the maximum, we're going to be able to calculate the maximum when, it, when just when it starts losing contact with the surface. So we know that the normal acceleration is equal to v squared over rho, and if we plug that into our equation, we know that m1g cosine beta is going to be equal to m1 v1 squared over rho, and if we plug in our known values, this becomes our critical maximum speed, because it's at n equals to zero. we get V1 max is equal to 3.86 meters per second. And then if we sub in V1 max into our very first equation, this one, V1 is equal to 2V2 is equal to 0, we get 3.86 plus 2v2 max is going to be equals to 0. And we get minus 1.937 meters per second. However, our coordinate system, our y was pointing downwards, and we know from our picture that v2 is supposed to be pointing upwards. So it's actually not negative based on if we consider the picture, V2 becomes 1.937 meters per second, pointing upwards. For problem 3, we've got a 1,350 kilogram car with each tire on it that can support a maximum friction force parallel to the road surface of 2,500 newtons. This force limit is nearly constant over all possible rectilinear and curvilinear car motion and is attainable only if the car does not skid. So, under this maximum braking, determine the total stopping distance S if the brakes are first applied at point A, where the car, is, car speed is 25 meters per second, and if the car follows the center line of the road. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write our known values. We know that the mass of the car is 1,350 kilograms. The maximum friction force of each tire is 2,500 newtons. Our radius is 80 meters. And 
our velocity at A is 25 meters per second. And we want to know the stopping uh, distance, the total stopping distance S. First, we're going to start with our motion from A to B. And we're going to draw our free body diagram. This is the car at A. And this is the distance from A to B we know is 10 meters. And the friction force, because there's going to be four tires, so this is going to be multiplied by 4, 4 Fb max. And this is our coordinate system. We know that the sum of forces in x is going to be equal to mAx. It's going to be minus 4 Fb max is equal to mCa. We're going to plug in our known values. Where a is equal to minus 7.407 meters per second squared. And then we're going to use our rectilinear equation, uh, our, our rectilinear motion equations, which is VB squared is equal to VA squared plus 2A SB minus SA. And we're going to plug in our known values. So that's 25 squared plus 2 minus 7.047 times 10. And that's going to give us a value for VB. The velocity at V is 21.84 meters per second. And then we're going to analyze our motion beyond point B. If this is our car, and this is our friction force, Fb max times 4. And our coordinate system is, in, is going to be in normal and tangential coordinates. This is because it's the same direction as rectilinear motion. Therefore, our sum of forces in a normal and a tangential is going to be minus 4 Fb max is equal to mCa total. This is the total acceleration. And if we plug in our known values, we get 10,000 over 1,350 which gives us a value for the total acceleration, which is 7.407 meters per second squared. Now we know that the total acceleration is going to be equal to an squared plus at AT squared under the square root. And we also know that an is going to be equal to v squared over rho, and AT is going to be equal to V dot squared. Which means that the, if we rearrange this equation, we get square root, negative square root of A total squared plus, sorry, minus V to the power of 4 over rho squared. We know that VdV is equal to AdS, so we're going to plug that into our equation.
and we're going to start integrating from VB to zero until it completely stops. So that's minus V over A total squared minus V, v over V to the power of four over rho squared all under the square root. And then we're going to integrate ds from 10 to sb. So that's from point b to beyond. Or until it stops. Now we're going to use the substitution method to find the integral. So we're going to sub u into v squared, which means du over dv is equal to 2v. Then we're going to try to simplify our integral. And then we're going to use our trig identities to solve this integral so that we get rho over 2 inverse sine of u over a total rho is equal to sb minus 10. And we're going to plug in our v squared again. So our SB becomes equals to 10 plus 80 over 2 inverse sine of 21.84 squared over 7.407 squared multiplied by 80 squared. Let's not forget that this is in radians. We get a value of SB which is 47.4 meters. However, this is just the distance from point B to stop. If we want to find the total distance S, total distance from breaking, at point A, it's going to be equal to SB plus 10, which gives us an answer of 57.4 meters. For our final problem, we've got a 5 kilogram block starting at rest on the incline in the system as shown below. A non-constant force F is applied to the block. The, constant surf the contact surface between the block and incline is smooth, and the attached spring mass system is in equilibrium before the force is applied. Determine the block's speed when S is equal to 0 0.5 meters. So we know the mass of the block is 5 kilograms. We know the spring, const, uh, the spring constant or stiffness is equal to 100 newtons per meter. Our non-constant force is equal to F 50s plus 100. And 
then we know that S2 is equal to 0 0.5 meters. This is where we want to find our velocity at S2. So before we start, we know that work done is equal to du is equal to ft ts. This is the equation for work done, where ft is the force displacement. Sorry. Force component in the direction of displacement and ds is the magnitude of the displacement. We also want to find out the work associated with spring force. So to know that, we need to know what the spring force is equal to. So it's equal to minus k xi, where this is the spring stiffness, and this is spring force. And xi is equal to the deformation. Therefore, our work is going to be equal to the integral of our spring force with respect to dxi. We also want to know what the elastic potential energy is. And that's going to be equal to half kx squared, where x is the displacement. We also want to know the gravitational potential energy. which is equal to mgh, where h is the height from the ground. And we also want to find out what the kinetic energy is, the kinetic energy is equal to t equals to half mv squared. And finally, we want to know how all of these energies tie up with work. So the work energy equation is going to be equal to T1 plus V1 plus work is equal to T2 plus V2. Bearing in mind that V1 is going to be equal to the total, um, the total potential energies. So we've got VE1 plus VG1, and it's the same thing here. V2 is going to be equal to VE2 plus VG2. Now that we know our uh, energy and work equations, we're going to analyze the system before force is applied. We know that before force is applied, the spring is in equilibrium. Therefore, when we draw the free body diagram, it's going to look like this. 
this is the angle. This is our coordinate system. And we also, let's say that the distance from the bottom of the spring to the top of the spring is equal to S1. So when we analyze for the sum of forces in the x direction, it becomes Fs1 minus mg sine theta is going to be equal to 0. Fs1 is going to be equal to Ks1, because that's the force spring equation minus mg sine 30, and we plug in our known values to find s. And we find s1 is equal to 0 0.245 meters. So that's the length of spring in equilibrium. Now our kinetic energy at before the force is applied is equal to zero because V1 is zero. However, our elastic potential energy is going to be equal to half Ks1 squared, which is half times 100 times 0 0.245 squared, giving us three joules. We're also going to analyze the, um, the gravitational and potential energy. We know that this is the height. And when we plug in our known values, we get VG1 is equal to 6 joules. And now we're going to analyze the system after force is applied if we draw our free body diagram we have gravity acting on our mass we've got our non-constant force F our normal force N, and this time spring force is going to be pulling us back. And let's call our distance here equals to S2. This is where we want to Sorry. Where we want to find V2. So we want to find V2 at distance S2. And to do that, we're going to use our work equation. So our work from 0 to S2 is going to be equal to the integral of f with respect to, to s from 0 to s2 and we're going to plug in our non-constant force equation which is 50s plus 100 and we're going to find the integral which is 50s squared over 2 plus 100s from 0 to 0 0.5. We're going to plug in our known values to get work done is equal to 56.25 joules. This is the total work done. And now we're going to find our elastic energy at point 0.2 that's going to be S2 minus S1 because we want to find the displacement starting when force is applied 
So V2 becomes equal to half times 100 times 0 0.5 minus 0 0.245, all squared. V2 becomes equal to 3.25 joules. And we're going to find our gravitational potential energy, which is mg times S2 plus S1 sine 30. And this is because we want to find the total height from the ground. And we're going to plug in our known values. That's going to give us 18.27 joules. And then we're going to use our work energy equation, which is T2 plus VE2 plus VG2 equals to T1 plus VE1 plus VG1 plus our work done, U. And we know that T1 is equal to 0. So we plug in our known values. To get T2 is equal to 43.73 joules. And then we use our kinetic energy equation, which is half mv squared. To get a final value for V2, which is equal to 4.18 meters per second. Thank you for watching this tutorial. If you have any questions, you can always email me or leave a comment in the comment section below. And uh, see you next week.